Okay, we are in a series called Smarty Pants, and uh, we are talking our way or working our way through the wisdom books of the Bible. Last week we talked about the book of Job, and tonight we're going to be looking at the Psalms, and next week we'll get into Proverbs. And so I've had a few people ask me, how are you going to get through 150 Psalms in a one-hour lesson? And the truth is I've been taking some auctioneer um, classes, and I think that I can do it really fast. No, I'm just kidding. You guys just listen fast, I'm going to talk fast, and obviously what I can't do is talk through um, each individual psalm, but what I can do is hit some highlights that I think will help you in your own personal study of those things. You guys may or may not be aware of this, on a Wednesday night crowd, it wouldn't surprise me if everybody already knows this, but just in case you didn't, uh, I'm just raise your awareness a little bit, that like a third of your Bible is made, out of, uh, made up of poetry. And it's hard sometimes for us to pick out because it doesn't look like the poems you're used to. Roses are red, violets are blue, Uh, I think you're awesome, and so are you, or whatever. Um, But it's poetry. You'll get cues, sometimes visual cues in your Bible when you open it up, and you'll see the way that it's arranged in, in stanzas and lines and verses and so forth. That's a clue that, hey, this is poetry that I'm looking at in this part. Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Song of Songs, all those um, are comprised of, of poetry. And so it's a little bit different than what we might be looking at before. These wisdom books that we're talking through are almost entirely poetic, and so there's some cues that we need to tune into if we're going to successfully interpret those. In fact, um, almost every Old Testament book has at least a little bit of poetry in it, and all of the, um, the prophets, when you get into the writing prophets, there's portions of each of those, or most of those anyways, that also contain sections of poetry in there. So a whole bunch of your Bible is poetry. And I'm going to talk to you about why that's important and the things that we got to think about in terms of interpreting poetry so that we don't make uh, mistakes in in judgment and understanding and trying to apply um, figurative poetry into literal truth just makes, makes for a bad formula. And so one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is you go in with one approach to all of the biblical literature. And uh, you think you understand or you know how to interpret the scriptures, and so you go in. And if you approach um, uh, the, the Psalms, like we'll be looking at tonight, the same way you would approach, say, the book of Romans, and you think that you interpret those the same way, you will undoubtedly make mistakes. You will misunderstand the point of the author, the point of the psalm, the value that's there. And, uh, and the biggest mistake probably is that we uh, misunderstand sometimes the character and the nature of God himself when we try to use a universal approach to um, interpreting all of these various scriptures. The Psalms, for instance, are not um, given to us primarily to teach us doctrine or moral behavior. Now, undoubtedly, as you go through there, you can glean some of those things. Through reading through the Psalms, for instance, you can find out some tips or cues on how we ought to behave on what is moral and immoral or at least some sort of judgment on those things. But that's not the primary function of the Psalms. The primary function of the Psalms is to tap into your emotions, okay? When we talk about the Word of God, many of us think that that the Scriptures are entirely God speaking to us. And what we have through uh, the wisdom literature, the Psalms in particular, uh, is an example of us speaking to God in an inspired model. And I'll explain what that means uh, as we go through this tonight. <clears throat> but they ex- it shows us the ways in which God would consider appropriate or pleasing for people to communicate and talk to him. For us as the readers of the Psalms, we need to kind of put ourselves in there to try to to understand what were they feeling when they were writing this or saying this or praying this or singing this. What was the emotion behind the situation that was in there? And I would say this, that until you can feel the Psalms, you don't understand the Psalms. If you've memorized the psalm, but you don't feel some sort of emotional connection to it, or at least an emotional understanding of what it was that the author was feeling at the time, then you haven't done your homework yet. You're not done. So there are many people that are able to quote psalms. There are many people that can read psalms, but you don't understand psalms until you can feel psalms. Everybody with me? All right, so there's some differences here. Let me just... I know you guys, um, this is my Wednesday night crowd, so you can handle this kind of stuff. The New Testament letters, which we talked through. Many of you were here for the um, Words with Friends series that we went through the entire New Testament and all the writings of Paul and the other apostles. Those things are written primarily to appeal to logic. 
These are our um, uh, defenses of the gospel, defenses of doctrine. They are um, uh, apologetic in nature in that they're trying to prove a point and they, they're built in a way that you would think about a legal argument being built or an argument that you would have being built where you're trying to prove a point. And so it's moving in a, a systematic direction, in a single direction towards a point. And it would say, because of this, then this, therefore this, in light of these things, this. And so it's A plus B equals C, trying to apply to logic. The Psalms and the Old Testament poetry in general appeal to emotion. This is what I'm trying to say. The point of this is not to win an argument. The point of the Psalms is to help you feel or to understand what, uh, what we can feel or should feel and how we can express those feelings towards God. And so the New Testament letters, they're trying to make an argument. It's rational. And, and that's the central point of those things. In the Psalms, the centrality of the Psalms is surrounding images. Now, obviously, it's not a photo book. Um, however, there are images or imagery that are used throughout the Psalms, as there would in any other kind of poetry, that you need to tune into. Uh, likewise, with the New Testament and the, the letters of the New Testament, or prose, if we talk about it that way, you're going to look at syntax and grammar and what is he saying, and what's the context of that sentence, and what's the word order and the punctuation, and all those things matter when you're trying to read a New Testament letter. Not so much when you're going through the Psalms. What's important in the Psalms is to understand the figures of speech, that there is a type of speaking that's taking place in here that you need to identify as poetic and symbolic um, imagery so that you don't think improperly about what's being said. And I'm going to show you lots of examples. But here's one way for me to do it. Um, obviously, I have the advantage of actual images. Whoops. Uh, here, which maybe they didn't, or they, they, they definitely didn't. Both of these are drawings, yes? Both pictures are drawings, yes, they are. However, they're dramatically different kinds of drawings. On the left, you have a mechanical drawing. It's a cross-section of an engine that's got a diagram of parts that's trying to explain to you how those parts fit together and how that thing operates as a whole. On the right side, uh, representing the Old Testament poetry, you have a, a painting or a drawing that is made that you have to sort of pull the meaning out of by looking at the imagery. Is everybody still here with me? So when you look at that picture on the left and you see there's numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all that breakdown chart of this um, cross section that's on there, what you'd be looking for is the key on that drawing, right? I had to crop it to fit on the screen, but somewhere else is the rest of that that tells you what part one is, part two, part three, and it's to give you an understanding by breaking down how that part functions. The picture on the right does not have that. The way that you tap into the, what's being said, what the painter was trying to portray in that picture is by trying to look at it and figure it out, right? And so what you see on the picture of the right, you see Jesus, and you see nail-pierced hands, and you see he's holding someone up, and in that person's hands is a hammer, and in the other hand is a nail, and you are supposed to derive a, a meaning out of it. You have to tell yourself the story about what's behind that picture. Some of you have seen that picture before. Some of you may have that picture hanging in your house. Some of you connect with that picture when you see it emotionally because you say, you can say, I am that guy. Right? You guys okay? There, you can look at this and say, I am that guy. But what you're seeing here is Jesus, right, who's loving the very one that pierced him and nailed him to the cross. All right, so all of that is portrayed through imagery. There's no labels there. There's no breakdown. There's no cross-section. But through looking that image, you connect with it, not simply with your head, but with your emotions. If you bought that picture to hang in your living room, it's because you felt an emotional uh, a connection to that. I can see myself in this image, or this represents Jesus the way I see him or view him, and I feel connection. So it is with the poetry of your Old Testament. So it is with the Psalms. That's why I'm saying until you can feel it, you don't understand it. If you can, just, if you, if you can label parts A, B, C, D, that doesn't mean you get it. It simply means that you've seen it, okay? So let me break down some of these key elements. In, in just a few minutes, I'm going to have JT come up here, and he and I are going to tag team a little bit tonight. But there's some things that I think will help you 
when you go back through and you're reading the Psalms on your own so that you can understand them and, and interpret them correctly or divide them rightly. All right? And so here's some things that you'll see. First off is this word, terseness. And that just means that there's a whole lot that's being said with just very few words. So every sentence, every line that's in the Psalms is power-packed. I should have brought that little sphere. You guys know that sphere I have that's this little tiny thing that will blow up to be like four feet, four feet um, round? It's like that. Every sentence, every line in the Psalms is power-packed. So it's terse. It's very few words, but there's a whole lot of information that's packed in there. There's also a high degree of structure, which I'm going to explain to you in a moment, and also the figurative imagery, which I've talked about also. The most important or one of the most helpful things for you guys in understanding the Psalms, and, and how many of you have a Bible where um, when you look at the page and you see the Psalms written out, you can tell it's not arranged like a story, like the rest of the Bible. You can see the individual lines. Just raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm going to show a lot of that to you tonight, and I'll apologize in advance. Because I wanted to be able to show you the structure in here, I've, I had to shrink the font size on some of this so it fit on the screen. But one of the things I want you to be familiar with and understand in Hebrew poetry is this thing called parallelism. And in parallelism, the, what they're doing is they're, they will make a point and they'll say it in, the, in, in a sentence or in a line of the, that poem. And then they will say that same point again reworded. That's called parallelism, and I'm going to show you a whole bunch of examples. The Psalms are chock full. It's the number one dominant characteristic of the Psalms is parallelism. It's this idea that's being put forth and then being emphasized or explained in greater detail in the next line or two or three that's underneath it. That's this concept called parallelism. parallelism. So a couple lines of poetry, it's usually grouped up in two or three different lines, sometimes as many as four lines, that are taking one point and saying it again in a different way and saying it again in a different way and saying it again in a different way. Now, what's the value of saying the same thing over and over and over again? is to get it from a different perspective, right? How many have heard things explained one way and you didn't get it? You hear it explained another way and you're like, oh, that makes sense now, right? That's it. And so, so what you have in this depth, remember, they're already terse. There's a lot of information that's crammed in there. But in the depth of that, you have a whole bunch of stuff that's being shown to you from various perspectives. I'm going to show you some examples. Sometimes um, in, in this, this concept, remember, it's just one thought that's being brought through. Line, the first line is saying the same thing as the second line. This is the easiest one to understand, uh, or the easiest form to understand. So here's one, line A and line B are saying the same thing. It's the same idea. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. That's the same thing. Y'all see that? The same, same idea being presented in two different ways. Sometimes in parallelism, each line builds upon the previous one. So there's an idea that's being developed. A plus B plus C. And here's an example of that. Praise be to the Lord. Okay, why? For he showed me the wonders of his love. When? When I was in a city under siege. Okay, so it's the one idea. Praise the Lord. Why should I praise the Lord? Because of the wonders of his love that he showed me when I was developmental, okay? Okay. Another example of this would be uh, an illustration or an example. Sovereign Lord, my strong deliverer. Okay, so that's the idea, that the Lord is a strong deliverer. Well, let me give you an example of God being a strong deliverer. You shield my head in the day of battle. Now, again, this is figurative language, but put yourself 3,000 years ago when this, this, this person could actually have been on an actual field of battle in combat, how many would understand to have your head shielded would be valuable and important? So here he's saying, just like as I'm in a field of battle, you protecting my head preserves my life. You are a strong deliverer. You shield my head in a day of battle, okay? So it's the same idea being brought forward or an example that's being given. Sometimes it's a contrast. Line A, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Line B, contrast, but the way of the wicked 
leads to destruction. So you guys see how these all tie together? As you go through the Psalms, it's just going to jump off the page at you, line after line after line after line. It's one thing being said and then being said again the same way and emphasized once again. A lot of the Psalms, or some, some of the Psalms are acrostics. And, and you guys know this. This is, um, here's an example one. It's where each letter of the alphabet um, is, is the beginning uh, letter from the, the next line. So I gave you an example in English, A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, is an acrostic. Some of your psalms and other wisdom books are written this way. Here's some examples. Uh, Psalm 25, 34, you see them up there, are all acrostics, A, B, C, D, E, F, each line, starting with a different letter. Lamentations, several of the chapters that are written. Proverbs 31, we just had Mother's Day, right? So Proverbs 31 is the, um, uh, about the virtuous woman. It's an acrostic, A, B, C, D, E, F. Psalm 119, which you may be familiar with, I'm calling it a super acrostic because it's, it's eight lines at a time. So instead of A, B, C, D, E, it's A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 all the way through the entire Hebrew Bible. That's why that's such a long psalm when you go through there. So 22 letters that are in the Hebrew Bible, eight lines each. Count it for yourself. It's in there. Some of you may have a Bible that actually breaks it down for you, and you'll see it. Aleph, and the eight lines of, of verse that go down through there. Uh, I knew somebody was going to ask, well, what are the Hebrew? There it is. I'm not going to teach you Hebrew tonight, but those are them. Okay. Figurative imagery I've already mentioned to you, and, and I don't think this takes uh, a lot of time for me to under, explain to you guys. You guys understand. Poetic language, symbolic verbiage. This is the way that the psalmists are trying to communicate so that we today can understand what it is they're trying to say. I thought this quote was helpful. The psalmist didn't write essays. They painted pictures. If you can lock in on that truth, then you, you'll be halfway to understanding the psalms as you go through. The psalmist didn't write essays. They painted pictures. And the way they painted pictures was with words. Through all the things that you learned and forgot about in English class and literature class, all those um, uh, 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 words like um, similes and metaphors and hyperbole, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not an English teacher, so I'm not going to try to go by or go through them all. But uh, all this analogy and uh, personification and all those irony, all those things are in some way, shape, or form employed by the various writers of the Psalms. Uh, and I found the, these figures of speech in here because you guys knew that. How many, is there an English professor or teacher in here? Because I was just going to point everybody to you after service. So, no, they're just going to sit on their hands. Um, not admitting to that one. Okay, so here's our job. And I'm almost do done with, whoops, I just did something, guys. I'm sorry. I broke something. There it is. Um, our job now as we're, we're interpreting these things is to, to try to grasp their reality. When you read the Psalms, you need to try to put yourself in the shoes or in the life, if we can do it that way, of the person that's writing the Psalm that you're reading, okay? What is their reality? What is the situation that they're facing? What are, what are they going through and what are they feeling, okay? And then when you do that, you need to ask yourself, have I ever been in a situation like that? Have I ever felt that way? What was I going through when I felt that way? That's how you're going to make the emotional attachment to these psalms as you go through here. It, it, to, to do it properly, to understand what they mean. Because look, guys, you understand this. If you misunderstand the figurative language in this, what's being said, then you're going to misunderstand the whole point of the psalm in general. Is that true? Everybody understands? Figures of speech. If I say I've got your back, I don't really have your back. That means I'm going to... Uh, protect you. I'm going to stay loyal to you. I'm going to fight with you. All right? Well, if I say bite your tongue, you're not really going to chomp down on that thing, wiggly thing in the middle of your mouth. Bite your tongue just means be silent. Okay? So figures of speech, um, symbology, uh, these sort of, when they say the Lord is a strong tower, doesn't mean that he inhabits bricks and forms shape shifts into a building, right? This is simple stuff. Yes, say amen. All right. So here, here's the, the whole bottom line here, okay? The Psalms are going to teach us and give us inspired models. And by an inspired model, I, I could say it this way, an authorized example. When I say an inspired model, that's why it's like God says, that was pretty good. Put that one in the book. 
That was a good example of how you should do this when you're in this person's situation. And through the Psalms, we can learn how we should um, talk to God or pray and how we should sing and what our worship should be like and what are the things that we should sing about and so forth and also how we should meditate. And I know people get nervous here in the modern era when you start talking about meditating because you're thinking about some um, new age person uh, floating like in the air and doing like, oh, that's not meditating, all right? Meditating isn't scary. It's nothing complicated and there's nothing new age about it. To meditate is simply to think reflectively about what God has done for us. Has God ever done anything for you? Say amen. Amen. All right, so to meditate on those is to think of an example of something that God did for you and to think reflectively on it. What does that tell me about God and who he is and what kind of character that he has and how he feels towards me and so forth? That is to meditate on the Lord. Within your temple, O God, says Psalm 48, we meditate. What are some things? We meditate on your unfailing love. So what should I meditate? We're supposed to meditate. Let the the word of the Lord be in your heart and your mind at all times. Meditate on things of the Lord. Meditate on his unfailing love. What does his unfailing love mean to you? What is an example? When have you felt his unfailing love? When have you needed his unfailing love? What example can you give of his unfailing love? That is to meditate on the things of the Lord. To, To think reflectively about this characteristic, this event, this thing, and how it has um, interacted with my life. And I happen to think this, that if we would meditate more on the things of the Lord, we would have a deeper faith. See, the problem is when you externalize the things of the Lord and you externalize the Word of God and you externalize the doctrine or the message or the teaching, then it hasn't, it hadn't really worked its way through. Uh, some of you are teachers, or, or you've heard this before, that that as a student, you don't really understand something until you can relate it in your own words. As a husband or wife, this is an important part of communication. This is bonus material here. If you guys are in an intense dialogue, <laughs> until you understand your spouse's point of view in a way that you can restate what they're saying in your own words, you don't really understand it. Your work's not done. Stop trying to argue your point and start listening for a while. And so by meditating on the things of the Lord, we could begin to personalize the characteristics and the goodness and the unfailing love of God so that it's a part of us and not just something that the guy on the stage talked about on Wednesday night. The Psalms give us examples of how, how, not only how, but to tell us that it's okay to communicate our deepest emotions and needs. Now, we live in a world, in a church era, at least in America, where everybody puts on their plastic smile and the facade and they put on their Sunday best and, like, it's all sunshine and roses, right, when you come in here. And and we got to be holier than thou. And there's this sort of undercurrent where if you're doing right and living right, we talk about this with Job, that everything's going to be great in your life and no harm will fall you. And if somehow you admit that you're frustrated, ticked off, or you're just flat out mad at God, that somehow that's a lack of faith. Well, the Psalms would argue a different point. Because what we see when you go through the Psalms is God saying, it's okay to be honest about the way you're feeling. Amen. Like God's shoulders are big enough. Can I clue you in on something? He already knows how you really feel. All that stuff you say under your breath, he hears. All those that you pat yourself on the back, well, I thought it, but I didn't say it. God heard you thinking it. So you're like, Father, thou art wonderful. No, sometimes you want to say, you're ticking me off. How long, oh Lord, until you answer me? How long am I going to have to suffer and deal with this? Do you know they're laughing at you? They're laughing at me because I believe in you. Read your song. It's okay to tell God you're mad. It's okay to tell God something's bothering you. You don't understand. God's like got really broad shoulders. He can handle it. You're like a gnat on an elephant. You're not going to topple him over. Meditate on that. (laughs) Honesty with God is one of the things that we can learn through the Psalms. So there's some context in life. How many found that life seems to ebb and flow? 
It's got its ups and downs. Sometimes things are really good, aren't they? And there's those times in life where everything just seems like, woohoo, it's wonderful. Like, I don't really have any major issues. I don't really have any issues. And I'm feeling pretty blessed. And, I, you know, I've had seasons in my life where I feel like if Jesus was here, he would let me walk on water. Right? And I'm just like, I can pray for you because I don't really have. There are times, I mean, have a need in your life. Just a little hold up your hand. Like, I'm, no, I'm good. I'm good. In those times where things are going good and you can just see that the Lord has blessed you and looking around and be like, yeah, God's doing good to me. There's those seasons where you need to, to express that somehow unto God, and the Psalms can teach us. And here's an example. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness, The Lord is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and rich in love. You see, there's just those times where you're like, I just feel good today. Now, how many wish that that would just stay that way forever? Mm, That'd be nice, wouldn't it? But how many would also testify to the fact that it don't? And just as sure as you start to feel pretty good about where you're at, then you come into the next season where things don't feel so good, don't look so good, bad news comes, you lose your job, you get cancer, and someone close to you passes away or whatever. There are those times and seasons of life. And the Psalms speak to that too. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Does this sound like somebody is having a great day? This is like, help me. Don't bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me, and my heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. See, there's that figurative language that's just jumping out at you. I thirst for you like a parched land. So you just picture a broken, dry, barren desert and needing the rain. Answer me quickly, Lord. How many have ever said that? Like today would be good. For uh, my spirit fails, don't hide your face from me, or I'll be like those that go down to the pit. See, there's an emotion that's being communicated here that we need to tap into. And one thing I've learned this is this, that, that if you stay faithful to the Lord, yes, you got those mountaintops, and yes, you have those valleys, but you know what? When you're going through hell, I heard this, I read this quote, when you're going through hell, just keep going. Don't stop, just keep going, because eventually the Lord will bring you out. And there's another season of life where we've kind of come through it. When, when we're coming out of despair and into a time where things are beginning to turn around, and you might say something like this. Praise the Lord. Like, oh, thank God. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord, now picture, you guys know the history, right? The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exile or gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Right? So we've been in this period of exile, but now God is rebuilding Jerusalem. He's bringing us, he's healing us, and we're just praising him for doing that, having brought us through. So life is high times and low times, and if you're not at either of those, you're somewhere in between, right? You're either on your way down or you're on your way up because none of us gets to stay put. There's no, there's no like, freeze frame for life. Now, another thing I think is going to help you, and I'm, I'm wrapping up the, the teaching portion here. Is, is in your Bible, there's fine print that you most likely, many of you, just skip over. So underneath the title of a particular psalm is some like little italicized print that happens in between the, t- the, the title and the verse 1. You should read that. There's like information in there that could help you. It's things like this. For the director of music, huh, so this was a song. To the tune of Do Not Destroy, I don't happen to know that song, but David did, of David, a miktam, I don't even know how to say that, and my footnote said, that's probably a musical term, 
<laughs> but here's the important part. When he had fled from Saul into the cave. Gosh, that's important knowledge there. Remember, what my job is when I'm reading this thing is to understand the situation and try to feel what they would have felt. And so it's like, do you know the story? If not, you should. Maybe you should go back and read the story. Maybe you should learn about the life of David. Maybe you need to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the meta narrative that we've been talking about all this time because the context matters. It, ma it matters in the Psalms just like it does in all the rest of it. When the context is provided for you by the author, perhaps you should key into it. Because the psalmist is living like 1,000 B.C. And in between you and him is like a 3,000-year river. And situations are different. You can't impose your situation onto theirs. You have to glean theirs and see how it applies to yours. Read the fine print. So now we're understanding that, thinking about, okay, so the king, the most powerful man in the kingdom, and his armies are chasing after David, who's like um, a fugitive, all by himself. His life is in jeopardy, and he's hiding in a cave while the armies are going by. How would you feel if that's you? David says this. <laughs> have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in, for in you I take refuge. I'll take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Oh, do you see that? He's hiding in the cave, and he's not fretting for his life the way many of us would. He's saying, Lord, I'm just going to hide here in you. Take refuge in you. Have mercy on me until, until they get on out of here. You see, you read that you have to put yourself in there to feel what would this be like. Have I had times in my life where somebody's out to get me? Somebody more problem, somebody's saying bad things about me at work, and I can't defend myself. I'll just take refuge in him, and I'll just hide in him until, until the disaster passes, all right? And so here we go. Um, and JT, if you, if, where's he? There he is. Come on up here, and, I, and I'll do this. Here's, here's what we do with the Psalms, okay? And three quick points, one slide. This, the Psalms provide a guide for serious worship. That when we sing, when we gather together, and so much of our, our worship experience comes through music and through song. And since I can't sing, it just made sense for me to bring JT up here. I, I, well, I can't sing well. You wouldn't like it. The, the Psalms are examples of how to pray and speak honestly to God. It's showing you that it's okay. Here's people going through difficult times expressing how they feel and praying to God. And examples of meditation on what God has done for us. And all that is in the Psalms. And then I'm just going to tell you a story of when, when the Psalms became real for me. I was in the military, and most of you know this, and in uh, summer, late summer of 1995, I got sent to Turkey. And, and we were doing, uh, it's like search and rescue in the northern no-fly zone, okay, over Iraq. So this is right after Desert Storm, the first one, or shortly thereafter. And, and we're, our mission is there. And I take the long flight over there, uh, just like all you military people have done many times yourselves. And to get there, and they, they sh put you where they're going to put you. And this was a tent city. And they say, this is your tent. And I went in there, and this is your room. And I went in there, and you're just exhausted. You know, after that flight, getting over there, you're tired, and you can't do anything. And I, I just went to sleep. And so I got there, and I fell asleep, and I had a dream. Now, listen to me. I'm not Martin Luther King Jr., um, but I had a dream. <laughs> and if I could ever tell you, if, I, if I've ever, ever had a divinely inspired dream, I've only had one, and this was it. And I had been saved for about a year. Um, it was 1994 when I gave my heart to the Lord, and a year later, I'm in Turkey here in this thing. And in my dream, I was um, approaching a, a large house, like a mansion like this, and I, I was walking in the back door. I remember walking in the back door, and somehow this opened up into the kitchen. And so I walked into the kitchen of this house, and as I'm looking around, I realized, like, I had been here before. And so, I, but I couldn't remember when or where, but somehow everything seemed familiar to me, like I had been here a long time ago. 
And so I'm walking through, and I come out of the kitchen, and I'm heading on through the dining room and the living room area, and I became aware of the fact that I wasn't alone in the house, that some, someone or something else was in the house and was watching me. And it, it knew me. This, this, this thing that was watching me knew me and remembered me and was glad that I was back in the house. And so I, I, I'm walking through, and I round the corner, and there was a, a staircase that, that was going upstairs. And I went up, started to go up the stairs, and as I went up the stairs, I began to feel that presence that had been watching me started to, like, close in. Do you know what, what I'm talking about, where you kind of feel like something is coming behind you? And so I could feel this presence coming in, and I realized that whatever this was hated me. And that it, it wasn't glad that I was back because it intended to bless me. It was glad I was back because it wanted to kill me. And as I was walking up the steps, I could literally almost feel like a blanket that was starting to come on me of this, this presence that was there. And I, I got up to the second floor. In the first room that was on the left, there was the only thing in the room was a little table with a telephone. And the telephone had the old dial. Remember those phones? It was going to take you like 15 years to call anybody. I picked up that phone, and I started to call friends of mine and I, to ask them to come and help. And I called a friend of mine, Roy. And Roy is the guy that, for all intents and purposes, he's the one that led me to the Lord. He's the reason that I came to faith in Christ was Roy. I called Roy, and I couldn't get an answer. And so I hung up the phone, and I tried to call my pastor at the time to get him to come and to help me. And my pastor couldn't come. He wasn't available. And I called one more person from the church. Her name was Sister Caver. Now, I, she has a different name in different churches, but every church has that lady, you know, that's like the prayer warrior that everybody knows. And you, most of you in this room already have somebody in mind for this church. But in my last church, that person's name was Caver. And I called Sister Caver because she was a prayer warrior, and I needed her to get over there and help me to get this thing off my back, and she couldn't come either. And when I hung up the phone with her, I hung up and the table busted, and the phone fell down, and I just felt like, this, like, I'm about to be killed if I don't get out of this house. And I ran down the stairs, and I ran out the door that I came in, I ran to the front, and I got to the street. I got out of the house, and I'm, my heart is beating, and I'm scared to death. And I look back up at the house, just like this. I looked at the house, and in that top window, that presence that had been chasing me began to materialize and started laughing at me. And I woke up. And here's what I knew. I knew that was from the Lord. And I knew what it meant. See, that house represented the environment that I had found myself back in. See, I'd been saved a year earlier, but that was the first time I had deployed. For that year up until that point, I was surrounded by church people all the time. And what the Lord was telling me is I had no strength, no spiritual strength of my own. That the strength that I had to endure temptation and sin and all those things was merely coming from the fact that I hung around other people that were prayer warriors on their own. But now I found myself in a situation where I had no prayer warrior and nobody else to guard me. And the Lord was telling me I had to learn to do it for myself. That Satan remembered me, was glad I was back, and intended to use that time to kill me. And I fell down off my little bed, and at the foot of that little bed, in the best I could, a year after being saved, tears falling down my face, said, God, I don't know how to do this for myself. And as clear as you're hearing me right now, not audibly, but still clearly, as clear as you're hearing me right now, I heard the Lord say, I gave you the Psalms to teach you. And I said, okay. Okay. And I scrambled, and I found the Bible that I had packed with me, and I randomly opened it up frantically to the Psalms, and this is where I turned. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Don't let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths, Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they're from old. Don't remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, 
For you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways, and he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it's great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I'm lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress. Take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Don't let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. And I'm telling you, in Turkey, that deployment, when Satan sought to kill me, the Lord called me into ministry. And when I came back from that trip, I knew that this is what I'd be doing someday. I th to God be the glory. That ain't me. But what that did, that incident, started a love affair with the Psalms that has never ended. I learned how to pray through reading the Psalms. And I'm just one story. Here's another. For me, as I started to kind of think through my connection with the Psalms, and as a worship leader, you have to understand that, that that's kind of where most of us kind of live naturally. But there's one incident in my life that I found to be really significant, not only because God used it to speak into my life, but he used it to begin to speak into other people's life as well. I was in a situation where I knew I was where God had planted me, and I knew I was doing what God had called me to do. But every day when I would wake up and I would go do what God had called me to do, it felt like there were more forces against me than there were for me. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to walk at the beach or walk through the sand with boots on or with shoes on, and God forbid your wife make you carry a beach caddy with you and you're pulling it along behind you. It feels like you're pulling against everything, and by the time you get done walking, you're exhausted. And every day I would come home and I would be exhausted. And every morning I would wake up and I would be exhausted. And something began to develop over time. I would bring that poison home with me and I would begin to vomit it on my wife. And the same poisonous atmosphere that I was going through during the day, I would come through at home because naturally she was defensive for me because she loved me. And so she would be just as frustrated as I was when I come home because she could see it on me. And like I said, as worship leaders, we naturally kind of lean towards the Psalms. And there was one morning I remember specifically that I sat down at the keyboard and I was doing my devotions and I was reading in the Psalms and I said, God, I just need peace. And Psalms 85 kind of came to mind and I'm going to read just a little bit of it. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. And this is what was kind of birthed out of that moment. Give me peace. Give me perfect. 
perfect peace, Lord, when the storms of life are raging and the waters start to rise. Give me hope, a hope that's never changing as the world begins to falter. Give me hope. When the mountains start to rumble and when things begin to crumble, the rocks of life will never hold me down. Because there's peace in the arms of God and there's hope in the love of God and there's power in the hope. When the storms of life are raging and the waters start to rise, give me hope, a hope that's never changing as the world begins to falter. Give me hope, give me peace. Wow. You wrote that, right? You see, you can't, you can't sing and write something like that birthed out of a psalm until you feel the psalm, until you feel the moment. So I told you there are times in life uh, where we go through these ups and downs and different things and, and that we can use the psalms as meditation, but we can use them as prayers, examples of prayer. And I'm going to show you how we can take these and, and turn a psalm into a prayer just by reading it off the page. And so sometimes um, in life you're coming through a season of despair and, and now you're beginning to see the sun come to rise. And so you might pray something like Psalm 103. Lord, I praise you with all my soul, with all my inmost being, God, I praise your holy name. Lord, I praise you with my soul and I'll not forget all of your benefits. God, you've forgiven all of my sins and you've healed all of my diseases. God, you've redeemed my life from the pit and you've crowned me with love and compassion. God, you satisfy my desires with good things so that my youth, my strength is renewed like the eagles. And I love you. Amen. But you can also sing it. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Sometimes the world is just crumbling around you, and it takes all your strength just to roll out of bed. And in days where you don't know where you're going to get the strength to face what sits before you, you might pray something like Psalm 5. 
Listen to my words, Lord, and consider my lament. Father, I pray that you'll hear my cry for help because you are my king and you are my God. And it's to you and you alone that I pray. God, in the morning, I pray that you'd hear my voice because in the morning, I'll bring my request before you. And God, all day long, I'll wait expectantly for your answer. But I, by your great love, Lord, I can come into your presence. And in reverence, I bow down before you, before your temple, and worship you. Amen. And this is what it'd sound like if you sang it. Broken, I run to you for your arms are open wide. See, I am weary, but I know your touch restores my life. So I'll So I So many times I've heard people say, I just don't know how to pray. I would say to you tonight, find a psalm and pray the psalms. Sometimes you'll find yourself in those situations we all are favorite, right? The time in life where everything seems to be going good and you're feeling good and God's blessings have come through and you might find a psalm like this and pray something like this. Lord, I thank you because you are good to me. God, your love endures. I'm up and down and I'm all over the place and sometimes I mess up, but not your love. Your love endures. It sticks with me through all the ups and downs. And I give thanks to you because you're my God. You're God of all the gods. When I think about all the things in this world that people worship and chase after, I'm saying to you today, God, that I chase after you. You're my God. Not money, not position, not power, not the things of this world. You are the God of all gods. And your love endures over me, and I rejoice in that. You might say, Lord, I give thanks to you, and it's a pleasure to serve you as my Lord. But I serve you because your love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Come on and stand up with me just for a minute before we leave, and let's sing this together. We all know it. We just got done saying that his love endures forever, and his love never fails, his never changes. Amen.
emotions rage, I don't have to be afraid. <laughs> I don't have to be afraid. Why? Because I know that you love me. Well, I had a lot of people love me, but that doesn't mean they came through. Well, there's a difference between all those people and God because his love never fails. See, the Psalms can bless your life. All you got to do is open them up, read them, meditate on them, pray them, and sing them. We stand here on Sunday mornings. So it's not just words on the page or on the screen. That's life. That's faith. That's joy. That's God's will.